Give a warm welcome to Congressman Biggs, who is joining us. Thank you. And we're going to take just a few minutes, and uh, we'll let the uh, uh, congressman tell us what's happening in Washington, uh, go over some of those key issues. We have some follow-up questions that we've derived from some of our conversations with uh, membership. And then uh, we'll have a few questions from the floor if there's time, and then we'll, um, we'll be out. But, uh, Congressman, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Um, so uh, I thought going for the state, just, just so you know, the state moves a whole lot faster than the, the Congress does. Um, and I thought we had a real pedestrian last two years, fairly slow walking. Um, but uh, what we've done with these first three months in Congress seems um, drone-like compared to uh, what we did. Maybe the last two years looked very energetic, <laughs> I can put that way. So, uh, I will just tell you just a couple things that are, that are of note, that are, con that are concerned to me, that I, that I hope concern you, that I'm trying to elevate the attention on, is that um, we have a $22 trillion national debt. And the way to put that into perspective is our, our total uh, GDP is about 21 trillion, so so we're we're underwater just on an annual basis, and uh, so another another way to think about it is uh, since we did the tax reform and, and the regulatory reform things we did about 18 months ago, um, the total tax revenue that we get on an uh, on a monthly basis is record. Each month it, it surpasses the previous month about the last 14 months. So we have had we have the highest 14-month total of revenue, tax revenue in the history of this country. Wow. That's pretty amazing. It's awesome. It is awesome, but it is also sad when you realize that nonetheless we will have a $960 billion structural deficit because our spending did not get adjusted at all. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, that's, a, that's a spending problem more than anything else. And so uh, we're dealing with... Uh, the fact that we've got mandatory spending, or uh, I call it contractual promise spending, um, which is which is Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, a few other smaller programs, those are growing far faster than the revenue is growing. So that the the benchmarks to look at it about 2026 to 2028, that's when we uh, become totally upside down with Social Security. So this, these are things you gotta you gotta really start looking at. And so I'm trying to elevate this. I've introduced a resolution. To introduce the same resolution last year, you got 12, I think it was, 12, 15 co-sponsors um, about the national debt as a security threat. And that's, that should be a bipartisan issue, in my, my opinion. And so we've reached out. Um, and this year we have over 50 uh, co-sponsors. And that's pretty good because it's starting to, we're starting to elevate it. And we have to elevate the conversation because what's happened We've not had a balanced budget in Congress for the last 20 years. Uh, uh, seven, I think, was the last uh, balanced budget. And so what Congress does is they do a series of short-term spending bills. And when you do short-term spending bills, um, you never really get around to addressing your spending issues or, or your budgetary issues. So um, that's, what, that's one of the things I'm trying to do right now. Uh, other things that are happening in Congress, uh, there's HR one passed out of the House. That's a that's an election elections re reform bill, uh, very dense, very rich with with stuff. Uh, um, I voted against it. I don't I don't like the bill. I think it's really going to federalize elections far more. The way to think of that is uh, a great example. There's two examples. One is the Independent Redistricting Commission that we in Arizona passed as voters. Whether you like it or not, that's that's where we are. They're going to, the federal government will take that away and they have, will have their own commission at the federal level that will be district, which is unconstitutional actually, but, but that's, that's where they're going. Um, and the other thing is, um, we're, we're familiar with this because we've had the clean elections experiment going on for 20 years, whatever it is now. Uh, they will, that bill, if it passes and were to be signed in law, which I don't think it will be, will provide a six to one match for anything under a $200 donation. So a way to think of it is Act Blue um, raised, I think it's $160 million in uh, under $200 donations. Um, 
the bill is constructed for under two hundred dollar donations, and you, each under two hundred dollar donation would be matched six to one. So, and that six would be federal dollars going to match. So, uh, it's it, these are these are problems. Okay, these are problematic things. So that's that's a bill that that came out of the ha uh, house and is going to go to the senate. And so what you're going to see now, if you watch. If, if you're interested and watch closely, you're going to see a lot of bills come out of the House because the House is, is controlled by uh, Speaker Pelosi and the Democrats. And so they're, they're doing their deal. They'll get to the Senate, which is controlled by McConnell and, and uh, uh, the Republicans. They, they will be the backstop. And so I, I would say you're going to see like some amount of activity. I don't know how much, but it's going to, going to be surrounding a big mile, a pile of spaces. So there won't be a whole lot done on any particular given issue. Um, I hate to say that, but that's, in some places that'll be good, in other places that'll be bad. But that's that's kind of just a thumbnail, I and mean, we can go into more specifics if you want, but, um, but that's kind of, I hope it only gives you a little, little picture. Uh, it does. Uh, my wife always tells me I should be more hopeful. Uh, so. I'll, try, I'll try to throw a little something, a little hope, yeah. hope in toward the end. Well, you touched on one of the points that I wanted to bring up. So um, going through uh, any sort of feed now on your electronic device, um, it would appear that um, the left has moved and the right has moved, and there's actually no middle ground whatsoever. You mentioned getting bipartisan support for the deficit problem. Um, is there such thing as bipartisan uh, work in Congress, and can we get something through? Yeah. Now. You, now yeah, you really can. There are things that 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 both sides agree on. So, um, um, for instance, I've I've worked with um, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, and we got uh, the the Jack Act through the House right toward the end of the last session. That that was an, uh, that was an anti-corruption and lobbying uh, bill that we did. Um, so there's there's a there's a lot of interaction. Uh, what what you see really is. Um, uh, in the media, they they love conflict. I guess a conflict must sell. Um, so they they will highlight the conflict, but underneath that conflict, there's a lot of discussion and relationships that go on between both sides. And and um, uh, the, you'll see you'll see a lot of um, I would say I don't want to say smaller bills, but smaller issues that are addressed that are not that don't have a lot of sizzle to them that you will get both sides on. We still you'll still still see past um, a, the vast majority of bills will still be bipartisan. Um, you just won't hear about them too much uh, because they just, they may be, you know, on a national wide basis inconsequential, but they're, they're important to a district or something like that. And those will go through on a, on a bipartisan basis. So there's a lot of that going on, but there's also a lot of, of duck and chuck that goes on at the, uh, uh, on the, on the stuff that you see in the media. So. Which brings us to the Justice Department. Oh, yeah. Um, and one of the committees, I believe, that you serve on. Um, so um, we're supposed to be wrapping up the Mueller investigation, um, but it seems that 20 more want to be opened up. Um, so what's happening over there? Well, um, so I sit on the Judiciary Committee and uh, had the privilege of last session working on a task force where we where we did a lot of the closed door depositions and interviews you might have seen and heard about, um, which was highly intriguing, quite frankly. But um, as we go forward, I'm going to take the, the deal about the, the DOJ and the FBI. And there are some real concerns um, on um, uh, not just noted by by those of us who may be partisan or whatnot, but by the Inspector General. Mr. Horowitz, who went in and, and conducted a pretty thorough investigation. He's conducting another investigation. Uh, I, I'll be honest with you, I did not know Congress did so many investigations, but we are full of investigations. <laughs> so you've got the Inspector General, he's doing an additional investigation, um, and I, I believe an expanded investigation. Uh, Mr. Barr said he's going to reopen an investigation, but Jeff Sessions had said he would re open a, a couple of investigations that he never did. So when you get to DOJ and FBI at the highest levels, um, there's some real serious allegations and some problems that need to be resolved. 
having set that aside, but what's going on now is you have um, five um, chair, uh, new, new, new chairmen, chairwomen of committees in Congress uh, who have indicated very strongly that they want to if, if, uh, expand investigations there or change the tenor or change the direction of some of these investigations. So in the Judiciary Committee, Jerry Nadler is, is the chairman. He's from New York. And um, he is um, convinced that, uh, that there's been obstruction of justice by the Trump administration. Um, although he's also said that there's absolutely no evidence of, of, of this. Uh, uh, he's, I mean, these are public statements from Jerry. Uh, and he has uh, issued uh, 81 investigation letters. And so when you send out an investigatory letter to an entity or an individual, it's, it's a precursor to bring him in on a subpoena. And a subpoena in Congress is it's considered to be a very serious thing. And, and there's all sorts of potential criminal and civil liability if you are untruthful in subpoena. So Jerry's, Jerry's got 81 uh, of these letters out. The deadline was Monday for response. He's received, he, he has said publicly he's received uh, tens of thousands of, of documents in response to that. So that, that whatever that investigation is, which we're not really certain um, what he's trying to get at, um, is ongoing. Um, and I'll just tell you, so I don't know if any of you saw the witness list that he's got. It's real fun. Uh, because my, my, my favorite is uh, he's sent a letter to Julian Assange. Now Julian Assange is, is the guy who founded WikiLeaks. And he is, as you know, probably know, he is under uh, criminal charges in, a very, in various countries who have extradition orders out, but because he's been living in an embassy mm -hmm. uh, to avoid those for, I don't know how many years now, five, six, seven years, whatever it is, to avoid being hauled before all these courts all over the world. Mm. Um, and so I'm curious, just, I was just curious what he thought he was going to get from Julian Assange. And if he gets something, <laughs> I really want to see that. So that'll be fun. Uh, but, but but we've got that going on over there over there with with, with uh, Jerry. But you also have uh, uh, Chairman Cummings, who's the uh, Oversight and Reform Committee <coughs> Chair, and and he has an investigation open, and he is also not defined what that investigation is. And then uh, who's the third one? Intelligent Adam Schiff, uh, and Adam Schiff has opened up an investigation. And again, he is not defined what that is about. So normally, uh, so like in the Mueller investigation. Uh, that's a special counsel investigation. There's a scope letter that goes out that's, that's ostensibly to define what you're supposed to look at and, and, and put up guardrails to what you're looking at. Um, but none of these other investigations that the, the chairman are putting out, they, none of them have indicated exactly what it is they're looking for. So it's, it's a real broad sweep. Uh, uh, Maxine Waters uh, is in case she wants to open up an investigation, but she's, she's not at this, as, as we speak, as we sit here today. And then uh, Raul Grijalva has indicated he'd like to open up something, but he has not done it either. So you've got three more going that we're not sure where they're going. With regard to the Mueller investigation, uh, the report, now mind you, I've been, I've been told this for two months that it's due out next week. <laughs> so, and it hasn't come yet. Um, and we're not sure uh, what's going on, but I, I, I can tell you what I can tell you. And, and, and what I know is that um, he started bringing in a couple of new witnesses late last week that had not been involved before that are there now. And if they've come in, we have no idea what it looks like. Um, I, I, indications are, uh, oh, I want to get to the scope letter for the Mueller investigation. So we, we've actually requested the scope letter multiple times. And we finally got the scope letter. And it's like so many of the documents that we've received over time, it was heavily redacted. It was like, dear Mr. Mueller, redact, 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 redact. We look forward to your report, redact, redact, redact. So, so we, have no, we still have no idea what's in that, that scope letter. Nobody's ever seen a non-redacted scope letter, even in, even in the confidential state. So sometimes they've taken us into this, to the whatever, the SCIF, you know, the, the, the security clearance room. They, and I can only say so much, but I can say this. We still have never seen a, a, a non-redacted uh, scope letter. So, so when Mr. Mueller comes out with this report, the sense of Congress right now, both on both sides of the aisle, my, my colleagues on both sides, 
And but by the way, I do talk to my friends on the other side, and I do have friends on the other side. It's hard to believe most people say I don't have friends anywhere. But <laughs> I actually do, and and so we talk, and they, they all agree. That we just don't think it's going to be. It's not going to be what they had hoped it would be, and it's not going to be what we feared it would be. So the Democrats had hoped, we had feared. It looks like it's not going to be. Uh, nobody's expectations are going to be met. So um, that's why I think you're seeing these investigations open. And so without those scopes, uh, obviously casting as big a net as possible, hoping to find something, is anybody keeping track of man hours and costs and um, things of that nature? Well, um, it, it, yes, yeah, they, because they have to, they, they get a budget, the committees get budgets. I don't even know how big they are, but they're pretty big, these, they're, they're multi-million dollar budgets that these committees get to run their committees. And so there's, Somebody will have to provide an accounting that will be a public record. The Mueller investigation, as of the end of uh, the calendar year, was I think north of $28 million. And um, I never saw what the actual man hour uh, was. And, but I will tell you, the other, the other thing about it is we're also seeing um, some of the top attorneys from the Mueller team, the, the ones that um, had seniority on the Mueller team, they're leaving, which is another reason to believe that that they've kind of concluded the, 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 the bulk of it. Yeah. Time to get a new job. Um, yeah. Oh, I'll tell you how much they get paid down. Those guys, <laughs> it's a sweet gig. Um, uh, great. Um, and changing gears a little bit, um, uh, one of the issues that's uh, central to Arizona is the drought water contingency yeah. plan. Um, the governors of the seven states missed uh, deadline. Uh, it's now in federal hands and will be coming to Congress here shortly. Um, do you have thoughts on, on the plan itself and what's going to happen? Um, I'll leave the substance of the plan alone because we're, this is great. I mean, actually, I mean, the states actually put the feds in a, in a box. So we have to, we're going to have to, we have to basically approve whatever the states approve, which is a, I think that's a good turn of events. You know, so regardless of, of, of how strong the substance is or isn't. And, and I, I've talked to experts and, and some things going to be really great, some think it's, there's, there's some massive holes there. But, but the, the point is, um, my sense from Congress is we're, gonna, we're just going to pass that out. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be any major reason not to. And so people could probably work that out. It's just a question of when we can get to it. Do you think there might be an appropriation that goes with it? So for example, the Imperial District in California that through the wrench in wants $200 million to restore the salt in the sea. Right. Um, here locally, uh, Pinal County farmers are saying they need an additional $20 uh, million to, to pump groundwater faster than anticipated. I'm sure there's other expenditures along the way. Um, so, uh, I don't think that there necessarily will be a, an appropriation with it. And I'll tell you what, it gets back to the, what I said in the monologue is that um, we haven't done a regular order of budgeting in 20 years. Um, a regular order would mean you'd have 12 bills and they would, you would deal with stuff like this and you'd pick out of the, whatever bill, you know, the Ag Bill, Natural Resources Bill, whatever it might be. And you would put this in that bill, and you would debate that bill. And people would amend or uh, on the floor. We haven't ever done that since my well, my brief time in Congress, and it has been done for years really before that. So that leads me to believe that the bill will likely pass with no uh, conditioned appropriations. So that means it would come out with the substance, with no no money, and there would be a fight in, in the budget process going forward. And, and, and whether we actually in, engage in a real budget process remains to be seen. So, did, did, did it does. Okay. It, it does. Um, and that brings us back, though, to this budget process. So, um, and, and the 20-year and the number uh, for not having a real budget, um, the state has had a, a similar issue where there hasn't been much debate surrounding um, expenditures and going through committee to get the budget. Yeah. Um, so how do we get back? How do we get back to having a regular budget process and having those open debates and um, at least coming close to a, a structural um, budget? Um, 
there's a couple of things that would, first of all, that's why I'm running the resolution, I'm trying to raise awareness, not just in our body, which seems unaware of our problem, um, but also the public. I mean, we, we need the public to also respond and say, you get your house in order, get your budget in order. So that's one thing. The second thing is, is um, we came within inches when, uh, in 2017 when we were adopting rules to requiring that we do an actual budget process. So, but, but we couldn't even get that through the Republicans' side. But that's what I mean when I say within inches because then the Republicans were unified on the floor and voted for it. But we couldn't get that passed in our closed door meeting with regard to some special um, rules that would come in and kick in and say you have to do this to get to a regular order of, of processing budget. That's, the, that's what has to happen is, is enough members of Congress have also got to say to their leadership, do a budget, do your job in the regular order. Now here's the, here's the other problem that you have is when you get to the Senate, it's subject to um, certain filibuster rules that make it very difficult to get um, uh, uh, through that process. And so the former speaker's um, uh, rationale for doing things the way he did is that well, we, if we don't do whatever the Senate wants, we're not going to get anything done. And the Senate doesn't want us to do a, 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 the 12 budget votes. I'd say, and I, you know, I actually told this to him. I said, well, that just doesn't seem to make sense to me because we're elected as well. And so if you allow the Senate to dictate what we do, when the Constitution says money bills originate here, then you allow them to basically go around and control everything. Maybe what we should do is the best thing we can do get the votes in the House on, send it to the Senate, and let them be held accountable by the public for failure to deliver. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes, but that's, that's really what you have to do. You have to change <coughs> the mindset in Congress. And, and we need the public. Which starts with us. Which starts with the public saying, hey, do at least, you know, for good or ill, just do the process. Yeah. Whatever the outcome is going yeah. to be. Right. right. And get the debates going. Um, that's an important thing, and that's one of the things that we're working on, and we appreciate you being here so that we can start that process. Um, and along those lines, um, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada uh, are working on a new trade agreement that replaces NAFTA, NAFTA II, or USMCA. Um, what do you think that process is at, and how do you see that? Um, so so they're, still, they're still negotiating that, actually. They've got um, a series of the technical aspects that are under negotiation. So none of us have really seen the USMCA in a finished product. We, you know, you get some top lines and, and some bullet points, but you, we, we don't really know what it's going to look like ultimately. And, and I'm reading people who don't like it, people who do like it, and I'm thinking, well, how are they seeing this thing? Because they haven't actually, they're still negotiating some of this stuff. I would imagine that um, late spring, we're already, we're already in the spring, but I would say late spring, early summer is when you're going to start seeing that uh, start getting the finishing touches on it, and maybe sometime in the summer, uh, early fall, uh, there should be some hearings in Congress, and then some votes that go, that go on. That would be the timetable that I anticipate. It's been, it's been about a month since I asked um, uh, anybody who knew, I'm trying to think of what we're trying, I think we we're trying to get the Federal Trade uh, Lighthouser's office to give us some kind of timeline, and they they were just kind of very vague themselves. So uh, I would still say you're, you're good five to six months away before you see a finished product that, that's on the floor of the house. But still moving. They're still moving. Oh, yeah, it's still moving. Uh, Mexico, of course, being a very important trade partner for yeah. Arizona. Absolutely. And then um, we have the Skybridge project uh, right. over at uh, Phoenix, uh, Phoenix Mesa Gateway, um, which will allow us to ship into Mexico. So. That USMCA is going to be a very important trade agreement going forward. Um, the uh, the U.S. Chamber already trying to line up uh, active support from all of the local chambers as well. Um, and speaking of trade, um, so one of the um, biggest trade partners and um, disputes that we have going now is with China, of course, um, and the tariffs. The imbalance of trade in the past seemed to have served to um, allow them to um, steal intellectual property and 
fact, it was a requirement in many of the trade agreements um, and allowed for a military buildup in the South China Sea. How do you see that situation playing out? Okay, so I'll, I'll leave South China Sea for a second and, and, um, and go just to the tariffs and then trade and, and, and what's, what, what's happening there. So uh, the administration has indicated they're going to keep those tariffs in place um, for an, uh, an extended period of time while they continue to negotiate. Um, there's, there's ongoing negotiations. Um, two weeks ago, there was the China, Chinese delegation to come into the DC to, there's a high level delegation. The way this stuff works is you've got this, the first level that comes in, then you get the next level, and you start getting to your actual trade representatives who are conducting the, the negotiations. And then before, and the, all that's, that's wiped up before you get to the president and, and, uh, and the premier get together and, and do their, their PR thing. So you're somewhere in that middle, high middle level, and they're, they're in DC, they were in DC a couple weeks ago. So that's, so it's ongoing, and um, the administration, I, I don't know whether they're the shining sun or what, but they're, they're, they seem very optimistic that they're gonna get a trade deal. One of the biggest hitches that we have is the IP, intellectual property issues that are going forward. Um, we have, uh, we have a, a factory that's going to be repatriated to Arizona. Uh, I've been working with them, and I was trying to get, I was trying to get in Southeast Valley, because the, the owner of the factory is a Southeast Valley guy. But, but Phoenix has something that uh, the foreign trade zone, uh, that they can actually do right, and, and they shorten the, the, the process by about a year, because they have their own foreign trade zone officer in Phoenix. So I think they're going to end up in Phoenix, which is a bummer for for us because they're going to, that, that's going to be 600 to 1,000 jobs. But I, I talked to him specifically, for, I'm just giving this as an anecdotal story, but I said, tell me about the, 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 uh, the IP. He said, he said, because I was there early. He says, I was one of the first companies in China. I didn't have to get it up, but virtually everybody who came in after me was giving up IP just to be able to be in China. And the, I mean, we're talking big companies. You know, household name companies that were giving up significant, uh, otherwise patent rights to China. What does that really look like in practical terms? So, for for an example, what does Apple or somebody like that really do? Well, what what it'll do is it will give China uh, basically two two things. So, it allows them their domestic company to have access to the same technology. So they can come in and at lower labor costs produce the same, basically the same product that that we we've, we've sent our that we, that they outsourced our company yes. our, our companies outsourced to and and they basically gave over the competitive advantage they thought they were going to give away going to China. But now, but now they're so they have to off offset that some other way, right? And so that becomes a real problem for them. And that's what's going on. And so, actually, our, our trade deficit actually continues to grow with China. And um, the other thing, too, is um, the tariffs. Have, I think those of us who are free trade oriented were very nervous about what the outcomes of tariffs would be. And it turns out that uh, they haven't been nearly as dilatorious uh, for business here as we thought they would be. So that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. but. It means that we might not have been able to leverage enough on China to be able to do everything we, we really need to do to, to kind of even up the, uh, the trade, the trade war that's going on. Now, back to um, the South China Sea and and, and, and the uh, uh, geopolitical aspect of that. South China Sea is rich in minerals, and uh, and 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 particularly in the oil, but also critical minerals that are, that are necessary and. And, um, and I hate to date myself, but back when I was at ASU getting a master's, uh, working on this and then doing work on a P toward a PhD, which I never finished, I had all the coursework done, and it's just an unfortunate story I'll have to share sometime. But, <laughs> but um, what happened is, we, I, I, was, I, I studied Northeast Asia, so that's, that's where we're now. And the South China Sea was really critical and a hot topic then. But China had not yet developed a blue water navy at all. What happened is with the trade advantage that we've given China over the last 20 years, they've developed a blue water navy. They've uh, upgraded their military capacity. 
um, so it's on par with ours. In fact, we have got to work hard just to stay even and, and, and ahead in many respects. Um, our soldiers are trained better, uh, and we have we still have better equipment. And um, but China is also right there at the next gen. They're always with us. So we did that with our by with the trade deficits by allowing them to to the money, and that was really kicked up the Hong Kong uh, repatriation. So, what's going on in the South China Sea right now is China is advancing and laying claims where traditional claims belong to Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, um, uh, maybe Vietnam, Laos, and, and China is controlling. Now, why that's important is because that strategic uh, uh, the shipping lane that goes through there, that's all the oil uh, and minerals that are going to Ch uh, Japan and and Taiwan, who are big trading partners of ours, and who are modern uh, uh, countries, and they become they become compliant to Chinese requests, which is what Japan is trying to to uh, to bail out of right now, and try to figure a way to have a land in Taiwan too. These are really important to us from a military uh, point of view, and, um, and and make no mistake, you still have China is still a communist.